Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited about this. I'm very thoroughly excited about this. I've always uh, um, uh, wanted to talk to Esther Lightcap Meek. Uh, I've, uh, I'm currently reading two of her books, uh, Longing to Know and Contact with Reality. Um, uh, she, like me, is clearly deeply influenced by Polanyi, and she, like me, is reading other people like Marlo Ponti and D.C. Schindler to try and uh, make a deeper sense and a deeper understanding of uh, Polanyi's work. And she, like me, I believe, yeah, because this is part of the spirit of Polanyi, is trying to integrate uh, uh, the practice of science uh, with uh, the understanding of spirituality. And so... Um, that uh, I've just, I've just, uh, look, look the, the title of the book, right? Longing to know. That's just, it's <laughs> just so appropriate for a lot of the things that interest me and um, have influenced me. So first of all, Esther, just deeply heartfelt welcome. It's so good to meet you and get, be, be able to talk to you. Well, thank you. I feel like you're bringing me out into the mainstream <laughs> well, <laughs> from my okay. little eddy in the, some corner or other. <laughs> Well, that 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 that's. I mean, you you um, your name has frequently been recommended to me um, along the way, and I'd already been reading you, and other people recommended you from uh, what Sevilla King calls this little corner of the internet. Uh, all the people working around sort of the what I call what I've called the meaning crisis uh, and uh, related things. So maybe uh, you know, as a way of, of lifting you into the mainstream, if you if you will, uh, maybe tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, about your philosophical journey and apprenticeship, uh, what you see as your main sort of philosophical task now, and why that isn't just an abstract uh, yep. sort of academic thing, because it's clear from your work that although there's uh, academic rigor, that's that that's not the place where you want it to finally land, you don't want it just to land within academia. So if you could, uh, if you could uh, take some time and, and lay that out for us, that'd be great. Thank you. That's a, it's an honor to be asked to do that. So thank you. Uh, like you, apparently, I, I began life in a in a Bible believing Christian home yep. and church. And um, uh, I recollect around age 13, having what I later realized were skeptical questions. Right. One was, how do I know that God exists? But the other was, how do I know there's anything outside my mind? Right. So I was a, a baby Cartesian and didn't know. And of course, that sort of thing was not talked about at church. And uh, I just thought it was sin or something. Um, um, so I, I, I didn't get into trouble by ever voicing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, it was uh, in my high school years that um, my mother... Uh, who was a uh, worked at a Christian bookstore and read all the first editions. Um, uh, I followed her red pencil underlinings through Francis Schaeffer's The God Who Is There. And mm -hmm. that's when I began to realize that my questions weren't sin, they were philosophical. Mm -hmm. And that responses to them had sh shaped whole cultural epochs across the disciplines, which fired my imagination for interdisciplinary ventures. And then it was only later uh, that I, it was in a conversation with a, a, a very excited student uh, who uh, was telling me about all he was learning with this professor, Jim Greer, in his philosophy classes, that it, uh, it was on this, it was in the next 12 hours that I, um, you know, made the choice to uh, change colleges and change majors to study with this man sight unseen. And, and I feel like that was my, uh, you know, it was the eye-opening moment that that philosophy, not chemistry, I mean, I like chemistry, that's what I was studying, was what I needed to pursue to start to get at putting mm -hmm. these things together uh, in, and getting at what I was was after. So, so I haven't looked back from then. And uh, I found my experience was that philosophy, at least at the undergraduate level with that marvelous man really revitalized my faith. I felt like I'd been given answers, but didn't know what the questions were. <laughs> but I, I, I plowed through to a PhD because uh, uh, I felt like it was the right thing to do if I was ever gonna be in a place to help other people get their feet wet in philosophy, which is what I felt was of value for me to do. And, uh, you know, the graduate, experiences were um, dry as dust in an analytical yes. sort of a surrounding. But along the way, 
uh, some young man gave me Michael Polanyi's personal knowledge to read. Uh, and just at the point where I was trying to figure out a, a dissertation topic and I wanted to stay as general as possible. And I also loved the interdisciplinary and I also did, I loved science too. So, so uh, his work commended itself to me as a, a viable place. And then along came, and uh, I'm sure you know this name. Do you know Marjorie Green? Yes, yes. So she was visiting professor where I was and I studied my, my you know, postmodern and, and Marilu Ponty and stuff with her. Mm. Um, and if I can grow up to write philosophy like her, <laughs> I'll do a good thing because she's, she's just, a, a fantastic person and quite, a, a, you know, in a way, the philosopher that Polanyi never was. And, um, but then uh, oh, my life going on, you know, through um, past the PhD, I, I didn't feel like I had the answers I was looking for or understood anything about epistemology or anything. And I still had the skeptical question. So, so um, what I had been tantalized by in Polanyi that, you know, and contact with reality is my, um, you know, my less embarrassing version of my dissertation and a little bit brought up, up to date, but th this scientific discoverer just, just was confident that, you know, you've made contact with reality when you have a sense of the possibility of indeterminate future manifestations. And that sentence was the water of life to me, still is, I just got chills. <laughs> and, and that's what I wrote my dissertation on. And so it's, it's as if this scientific discoverer was assuring me, yes, you make contact with reality. And here's the, these, you know, exciting, inexhaustible range of, of future manifestations. And, and I, I am a very excitable person. And um, I, I just thought that was magic. And so then, eventually it came to the place where um, I got to start to teach this. I was almost 50 and uh, then to write it in a book and the book longing to know really is me trying to justify my own Christianity to me, mm -hmm. to myself. Yeah. And so it's a, a book for people considering Christianity, which I think is everybody uh, who have questions about knowing. And mm -hmm. so for me, I felt like, to just, I, when I read Polanyi, I felt like his epistemology just resonated with what I thought Christianity uh, should have as an epistemology. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, it, it just, um, it was very um, affirming for, for me. And so that, that's what I wrote about. So in Longing to Know, I asked, you know, how does knowing work? And then let's revisit knowing God in light of, of this approach to knowing. And oh, by the way, I think it's going to fix your golf game too. So, and so that's been my agenda to say, look, this is how knowing works in every area and getting straight on it will make you better at what you're already doing. Mm. So that's the angle I've been continuing to pursue through ever, ever since, just ever since. So business, uh, seminar, you know, or, or uh, right now I'm writing on a book, a book on artistry. I'm starting a series, taking my proposals into different areas. Next one might be therapy. Another might be education, that, that sort of a thing. Because I think this is, I feel like Polanyi's account about how knowing works is kind of a trump card. You have to do it to deny it. So um, it, it just seems like what I'm doing in we're in my epistemological therapy is kind of relaying the accents on people's lives so that they can see what they already are doing mm -hmm. in the way of knowing that is not the scientific method <laughs> mm -hmm. you know or or any other sort of methodological methodical procedure so so um i listened this morning to your four horsemen of meaning uh conversation and you know you uttered that sacred word insight <laughs> <laughs> you know and the idea of transformation and what you used somebody used the wonderful word proleptic 
I did. You know, I, 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 I have a, a crass way of saying it that I would never say in public, but, you know, uh, learning kind of happens in a backward sort of a way, <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's not linear, linear. You've got to mm -hmm. have this kind of this uh, graced uh, intrusion of, 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 of an insight that actually is transformative. So that's, that's, I've taken that Polanyan epistemology. And then what I've done is I've augmented it. Uh, it uh, my philosophy will always have that component because I think that that torpedoes and dispels a Cartesian modernist epistemology. Mm. And, uh, it does it really well, but then I've augmented it because I think this is implicit in Polanyi's work, though it wasn't what he was about, to, to say um, that this is suggesting a, a livelier interpersonal dynamic. So, so even in longing to know, when I talk about contact with reality, it's more like, uh, you know, it's not that reality answers your question so much as that it explodes them. So it's like reality contacts back or maybe even first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what you've got uh, lends itself well to uh, recasting the paradigm of knowing, and this is the thesis of loving to know, uh, the paradigm of knowing is the interpersonal covenantally constituted relationship best typified, I think, by the redemptive encounter where you know somebody walks in and <laughs> transforms your life you know so right, right. so that's the, what loving to know is about and um i but i find in all my years of teaching this that uh, if i start talking about love in connection with knowing and don't do the polanian groundwork yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh you know I, I talk about a daisy of dichotomies my daisy of dichotomies well love is an emotion it's out on the pedal and you know you might add it to knowing but it would be different from knowing and i want to dispel that whole thing and start over again so that you've got a dynamic of inviting the real mm -hmm. you know and finding that the real was there for the uh, first wooing you and then you've got more of a dance of mm -hmm. overture and response and the goal of knowing and i think the goal of humanness is communion with the real so what you're going for is not comprehensive information uh, to the end of certainty and control and commodification and power and all that. But what you're going for is uh, way more intimate, way more objective, uh, yeah. way more fun and, and lively. And it's, you know, communion. And I'm talking gardening, you know, yeah. that, uh, or just anything, you know, if you're a guitar, a guitarist, you know, you want an intimacy a communion with your your instrument with your jazz ensemble you know all of that so that's kind of where i am now lo lo loving to know came out in uh, 2011 i call it the big fat uh and the real reason it was fat was it was pregnant and so the little manual for knowing is just a, a skinny version <laughs> of loving to know and then contact with reality came out you know long after it was uh, begun so how does that how am i doing that's fantastic that was amazing <laughs> and i resonated with so much of what you were talking about but i didn't want to interrupt uh your flow at all that was that was appreciate great that. appreciate yeah. that consideration well there's so much there's so many points i mean um i've been pursuing a lot this project of dialogos and a dialogical model of knowing uh, the deep interconnection between loving and knowing, different kinds of knowing, um, this sense of connectedness, contact, um, and then, and, and, and again, all, all the Polanyan stuff. And the thing that impresses me about your work, you're right, it does reach into gardening, but it also reaches into Mino's paradox. And, you know, it, it, reach, yeah. it, 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 it spans all of that. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm facing a poverty of riches here kind of thing. There's so yeah, many well, things... Yeah. <laughs> And if I can add one more installment yep. that, that I'm sorry, I should have put this in, but you mentioned David Schindler. Yeah. I uh, stumbled on his work in 2014 and I, I fell in love. Me too. And, and in my uh, analytic training or, and in my church, neither place had I her ever heard classical Christian metaphysics. Yeah. And, and then to hear 
the ardor and the uh, machine gun metaphysics with which he carries it forth. Uh, the first thing I read by him is the essay called Surprised by Truth. Uh -huh. And I felt as if uh, I, had I had taken the test and gotten an A, and now somebody gave me the textbook. <laughs> Right, 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 right. So my recent years and now in my work, what I'm trying to do is is develop the metaphysical uh, therapy to go with my epistemological therapy. Right. I think it's listen all along, but I've I've needed to do the ton of work that Bishop Barron, you know, learned in the cradle. If I well, I, I I mean, I, I'm I know um, I've read Plato's Critique of Impure Reason by Schindler. Love and the Postmodern Predicament. I'm going to the Catholicity of Reason right now, and I'm reading some of the people he talks about, like Clark and uh, 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 Balthazar and people like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm doing a pretty deep I've dive. I've been swimming in that stuff for the last seven years, trying. Yeah, to yeah, and uh, and, and trying to connect the, his understanding of Plato to sort of an implicit uh, phenomenological understanding of Plato that's within Marlo Ponti, um, and so. Um, it's just been it's just been really really eye opening. It's, uh, I uh, I I find everything that he writes is brilliant. I recommend it as soon as I re I read it. Um, I think Plato's Critique of Impure Reason is the best best book I have, I've read. I don't think I even own it yet. I know I need to do work through that. It's the best. It's the best. It's I mean I it's it's the best commentary on the Republic I've ever read, and it might in fact be the best book on Plato that I've ever read. Um, and and um, and I've, had, I've read it with other people. I've not just read it, I've read it and studied it, discussed it. And, and it, I have taught Catholicity of Reason in my philosophy for theology class repeatedly. It's yeah. amazing. So book. I've gone through that several times and then Love and the Postmodern Predicament too. Yeah, and Love and the Postmodern Predicament is- I where... endorsed that, by the way. Yeah. So Good. proud of that, my name's on the back of his book. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's it's kind of odd that you and I haven't met uh, uh, up until now, but I, I'm glad. I, I, I'm so I'm, I'm I'm trying to think of where to start. Um, so, uh, first of all, I agree with you that like love is not an emotion. I think that's a mistake. Um, and, and it's not. A, it's definitely not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's much more like an existential mode uh, because of the way. If I if I'm if I love somebody that can make me jealous, angry, happy, sad, depressed, gleeful, like it, it's not an emotion, it's an existential mode. And then for me, and this is this is part of the Neoplatonic Christian tradition, this idea of a kind of knowing by loving um, and that and that what that means is something like there are truths that are only disclosed to us as we enter into a transformative relationship where we're transformed, we're undergoing transformation in order to come into more conformity, more contact uh, with the way a reality is presenting itself to us, uh, which is very analogous. And I think uh, you, you alluded to something to, the, to this earlier, analogous, you know, of coming into a deep loving of another person. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to use that uh, metaphor or, or analogy. And I say, you know, if I come to my beloved, and I say to her, you know, you remind me of all the other uh, women I've been with. Yeah, I've, got, right. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got you categorized really well. I know how to manipulate you uh, really exceedingly. And I, I've, I've got all the skills I need uh, uh, in our relationship. We're done. It's complete. It's like that relationship is now destroyed. Um, and so, and I say to people, if, you, if you're thinking of, uh, of, uh, of that, uh, of, knowledge along the, that line, you're gonna often cut yourself off from the most important kinds of knowing that are available to us. Right. Instead, right, you, you wanna be able to say something like, well, I don't have, I don't come to a point of, uh, of certainty as that kind of closure and that categorical grasp. Instead, you better I, not, I'm leaving you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Instead, you, you get into something more like, um, I talk about faithfulness, where it's just more this continuity of contact, which is, um, I'm going to recognize that you are continually going to break into me from outside of any conception I have of you and continually call me to transform in response to that. And I will feel I want to afford the same for you. That, right? And, when, and then I, I say, if you look at like 
that model, you see it, for example, in, in the symposium with Plato, you can see it in Schindler's work, right? This idea that we can, and we can, well, I'll, I'll, I'll use your example, right? The gardener can have that relationship to their garden, right? You know, or or, or your, the auto mechanic to the car, right? Or for me, the Tai Chi player to doing the form. Mm -hmm. And what I think I'm, for me is important about that is it brings in a dimension, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a minute and let, let you respond at length. But it brings in a dimension that has been lacking in the analytic understanding of knowledge. So the analytic understanding of, no, of knowledge has been satisfied with semantic meaning as that in term that, you know, semantic meaning, truth, and then, right? But this, what we're talking about now, this is what, and this is, I do a lot of work on this. This is what is philosophers like Susan Wolf or psychologists like Hicks and others are calling meaning in life. This is this sense of this dynamic dialogical connectedness. This is meaning in life. So if you ask people what makes their life meaningful, they don't list facts, they list connections. I, I feel deeply connected to myself, to other people, to reality. And it's that, and it's a dynamic living kind of connectedness. And this way of knowing, it doesn't exclude semantic meaning, but it brings in this deeper, this meaning in life aspect. And for me, that affords a possibility of linking the idea of knowledge back to the idea of wisdom, you know, the kind of knowledge that helps to make a life more meaningful, more fulfilling, uh, richer. I wonder, if, does any of that land for you as, uh, as, uh, as a way of thinking about what you're reflecting on? Well, I would like to add uh, the key word, as far as I'm concerned, in Polanyi's work to this discussion, and that is the idea of the subsidiary. Yes, yes. So that what you've got in a, a knowing, uh, in any knowing, is a two-level from to yes. subsidiary focal integration to an irreducible pattern. And that's, that's knowing. And I find that we need that, that idea of the subsidiary because uh, I, I, I can't, I feel like that's the key thing that you have to get about Michael Polanyi. And well, I feel like if, if I can just say this, no, please. Um, okay, I was, what was I gonna just say? Um, Oh, dang, I've lost my, my training. <laughs> but, but, oh, I know what I was going to say. For me, the modernist, the defective modernist epistemology, and, you know, my little shtick in life is to talk to kind of people on the street, like yeah, what the yeah. kind of the street philosophy is, because I, for one thing, I'm not an expert at all the philosophers, you know, but I, but I do think I'm picking up on kind of the ordinary what people usually think. But I think modernist epistemology renders uh, knowledge focal explicit bits. Yes, yes, yes. And, and what Polanyi is saying is that blinds you to the real. It blocks the real. So, right. you know, what he said was, if science worked like modernist epistemology said, no scientific discovery could ever happen. Exactly. But it does. So exactly. changing epistemology. So so really for you for you to be able to have meaning at all, like if for my words that are, you know, coming out of my mouth and my hand stuff for all any of that to mean anything, you need to be subsidiarily indwelling it to open onto a farther real. And so it's not like, okay, we can have this kind of knowledge and then we can have this kind of knowledge. Oh no, there is only one kind of knowledge and it's subsidiary focal integration. And that puts it all together. And I wonder what you think of that with all your expertise with different kinds of, of knowing. And, and in particular, I wonder how you feel about Polanyi's essay called, well, the two at the end of knowing and being, one is life's irreducible structure. What's the other one? The, she, you've got I, I, a logic of psychology. Let's see if I got this. Wait a minute. There's another one she's got in here. The structure of consciousness. That's the other one. Is that in knowing and being? Which one yeah. is that? Oh. It's, in, it's in her collection, Green's collection. I haven't read that. I just got it about a, a week ago. Uh, so I have well, to I, My favorite genre in philosophy is critical introductions. And this one 
is fantastic. I mean, in three pages, she does Polanyi, um, but then her collection of essays in there. So I do commend it to you. But I, I'm curious to see how what Polanyi was thinking about mind-body things at all goes with uh, your... Approach. Well, very much. So first of all, uh, uh, um, to, just to, to try and stitch what you said together with what I was saying about that, that dialogical relationship. I mean, what I was basically talking about is, you know, a, a mutual indwelling, um, yeah. right? Uh, and that, and what does that mean? Um, and it's it, uh, one of the things I find interesting is about Marlo Ponti and Polanyi both independently came to the, like, the tapping the cane uh, metaphor. Uh, I don't, did they ever communicate? I don't believe so, did they? Did they ever discuss? No, but it, I mean, Marjorie Green and her, uh, uh, unshy and unretiring way said, Michael, <laughs> you have to read Merleau Ponty. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and so he, he dutifully did so and footnoted. Um, but, you know, my conclusion in contact with reality is really I prefer Polanyi to Merleau Ponty, just like Schindler does. He, he, he doesn't, you know, embrace phenomenology either for similar reason. That is, we're realists. And, and, yeah. and so, you know, we're, we're interested in a in an inexhaustive real, which I don't think phenomenology even acknowledges. So, well, I might disagree with you on that. I think Marlo Ponti okay. does when he rejects Husserl's reduction for what I call the eidetic eduction. He definitely has a place for the inexhaustible. Um, I, I, uh, but I agree with you uh, that uh, there are certain prevalent interpretations of phenomenology that make it very idealistic and rather rather than realistic. But that. And there uh, phenomenological realists as they're called you know like jp2 was a yep. phenomenal realist so but back to your point about what the, about right about uh integration of the subsidiary into the focal I, i've been pointing out that out how that is um that's even it's often implicitly presupposed in a lot of the current models of consciousness um i've published a work uh, a book chapter with Leo Ferraro on trying to use that to understand uh, what is happening within consciousness, within meditation. Um, so, uh, so I, I like I'll have, you know you're tapping, and you can you're aware through the pencil of the phone, but then you can become aware of the pencil through your fingers, and then you can become aware of your and you, you and when people get that sense of how they can step back and look at what they were previously looking through. That is how I try and explain the movement of mind you're trying to engage in in meditation rather than just focus on your breath. Because that, that is inadequate for getting people to become aware of this dynamic structure of attention. All they do is they just have a metaphor of doing this, right? And what they're not doing is becoming aware of oh, weight. You know, attention is this layered dynamic structure that's doing this and doing all of this recursive integration, like in this highly layered fashion. And so that's an example of how I use it at, at you know, both trying to teach and explain what's going on in mindfulness. Um, about the more general thing about mind and body. Um, so I take that view, uh, although I, I do distinguish between kinds of knowing, but, um, where I, in fact, make ultimately a kind of Polanyian argument for what I take consciousness to be, which is what I call a participatory knowing through perspectival knowing of procedural knowing. Um, and so the, and you can't, uh, you can't ever make your participatory knowing fully focal because it is that, right? It's that ultimate, well, to use your language, contact with reality that grounds and makes possible all the other kinds of knowing. Um, so I, th that's ways. Of, so the, the idea is participatory knowing is knowing by communing, right? And, and that takes place below. Uh, you don't have to be an internalist. You don't have to know that you, right? So I think that it, 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 there's ways in which the way reality unfolds, evolution unfolds, culture, cognition, that, by, that shapes me and the world to fit together. Um, and therefore, I know it by being it. That right makes that that creates what Gibson calls affordances. Like yeah, I, I know that language from Green because yeah, you yeah. know, philosopher of biology. 
Yes, exactly. Participatory. So a biological instance of participatory knowing is something like an organism's niche construction, very much shaping the environment and being shaped by the environment, realizing and being realized, this co-realization process, very much. And that opens up for an organism affordances, like the graspability of the cup of the bottle, a real relation between. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but I like the, the language oh, of encounter and epiphany. I like the language of encounter and epiphany and 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 that sort of mutuality of of uh, it's personal, but it's not subjective. That's exactly uh, the point. That's exactly uh, the point. Yes. Involvement exactly. with it with with and and other that you regard. I mean, that's the other thing that's so awful about the modernist whatever is this dismissive disrespect of the other. You know, that's just or um, or or. or the 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 supervaluation of the other as something that is cannot be contacted like the the way that postmodernism picks up alterity and otherness and then makes right. it as something that is perpetually unreachable um which that, is also dismissive <laughs> yes 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 yeah in, in, in a in a more sort of convoluted fashion yeah. and so and then on top of what i would call the participatory knowing right certain affordances are drawn up into the way you're sizing things up, how things are made, being made salient to you. This is your perspectival knowing. This is knowing what it's like to be me here now, right? Um, and your participatory knowing through your perspectival knowing is what I would argue uh, consciousness ultimately is. And so you can yes. see th through and through, that's very, it's a very Polanian kind of structuring of the understanding. Um, and- Something I that I do I I uh, to contribute to this is please please a big deal about destructive analysis. So yeah. if if the pianist reverts to think about their fingers, of course, like right right. Yeah. So obviously, and and he talks about well that 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 can be valuable. It's also it also takes it's a risk, uh, and I can come back to that. But I what I've tried to say is somehow we've got to get in touch with the subsidiaries. And, and develop an intentionality and even an artistry about the subsidiaries as subsidiary. Well, so I wonder if that's maybe something that you are working with in what you're saying. Very much. I, uh, I think that virtuosity. I, yeah, uh, I, I've been invoking the term virtuosity myself also and trying to integrate uh, virtue and virtuosity and the virtual and how how are all these terms related to each other right now because we're throwing them out in the culture but we haven't bothered to carefully reflect on their possible relations so let, let, let me so the work i do on mindfulness is to try and use a polanian frame to explain the pretty well uh you know empirically uh confirmed idea that mindfulness affords insight um, which, of course, is also a traditional claim. Vipassana means insight, right? Um, vipassana, a, a kind of mindfulness meditation. And I, th I think, um, well, let, let me try it. Um, and, and this maps onto a lot of convergent literature. You do this initial move where you step back and look at the subsidiary, and it, it's you know, sort of destructive. But it's actually, it's actually adaptive. Um, it's what we call in the insight literature breaking frame. You've, right? You're looking through your frame. It's completely subsidiary and, the, and you don't realize how it's distorting. And then what you do is you step back and look at it rather than through it. And then you realize, oh, 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 and that's a meditative move. But then that you can't stay there because notice now I'm disconnected from the world and I don't know if I've made a good cor correction to my glasses. I have to now do with the contemplative move. I have to now rerun re-engage the integration machinery and see if I can actually indwell deeper into the world. That's what contemplation is. And then you, what you want to do is cycle between them. This breaks an inappropriate frame and this affords a new and more encompassing frame. And what I'm doing is I'm doing, there's sort of that three, those three moments. There's the breaking frame, right? And then I'm throwing myself into the dynamic self-organization of integration that affords me now making a frame. I break it. I, I commit to reintegration, and now I see as I haven't seen uh, before, and then I'm constantly looping between them uh, because yeah. they, they correct each other, they afford each other. And so that, for me, is the way in which I try to integrate the, the, the Polanian um, understanding of attention and right into 
uh, mindfulness and its relationship to insight. Yeah, that's that's I'll have to think about that some more because I think I, certainly he's got that, uh, you know, yeah. back and forth yep. that he yep. thinks is, is essential. And and I do, too. And the lovely thing about this is it's it's obviously so asymmetrical, you know, so I. I yeah. So I just have to think more about the, the way you're you're saying it. I, well, I of course, know. of course. I, 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 Actually, the interesting thing, John, is in this book I'm trying to write that I'm having such a hard time writing on artistry. I've got this extensive part on presence. Right. Which I, I think of as mindfulness and, and um, not that I, um, I'm not intimate with mindfulness so much, but it yeah. seems to me, and, and I would, this would be, I'd be glad to have your insight on this. It, it, it seems to me that when I think about what presence is, I'm putting together a whole bunch of things. One is attention. Yes. And, and one is com composure and consent. I think consent is this huge, huge thing in any act of coming to know. You have to, like, like a somehow a student has to, you know, lay out the syllabus and say, okay, I'm going to do this. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, or nothing's going to happen. So that kind of kind of consent. And it seems to, and I know in my book right now, I'm kind of putting those all in this same area of presence. I think of the the man of the Gadarenes that, you know, is found at the end sitting composed and in his right mind at Jesus feet. It's kind of like that. It's or like a dog sitting waiting for his his treat. <laughs> you know so maybe i'm wishing together more things than uh, no no wait 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 i can't believe the synchronicity so i've just published three papers this year on uh, on this and a very weird way a very not weird way a very odd case of presence uh so the the area in cog side that's doing a lot of this is of course in vr uh because the 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 defining feature the realness of vr is not the sense of conviction about vr Virtual reality, virtual reality. Oh, okay. Right? okay, we're doing it right now, right? Um, right, right. And so, why, like, why is it that, uh, like, you feel real to me? And it's this sense of presence. And and so you can think about it also in video video gamer designers are like because if they can get the player to feel like they're present, then the the game just takes off, right? And, and it's not. And here's one of the key things, even from the uh, uh, the video game work. And then I'll talk about this special case in a second. It's not verisimilitude, right? You can have a virtual environment that looks like technically very realistic, no sense of presence. And then you can have something really weird like Tetris and it creates a tremendous sense of presence of being here now and in the game. That's the, con that's the common metaphor. I'm not out here, but again, the contact metaphor, I'm in the game, I'm really yeah. there, right? Yeah, now now I want to- it's a belonging, and it and it's and, and it's interesting to try and figure out what it is that that's uh, going on there. Now let me try and the, the what what Dan Shappy and I we published three papers on. You have the NASA scientists on Earth moving the rovers around on Mars, and what they look for, and in addition to you know math and blah blah blah, they look for people that can be the rover on Mars. Yeah. So in dwelling. Exactly, exactly. And what's interesting is going back to what we said earlier is that uh, it's and one like uh, one of the main ethnographers, Bertessi, talks about this kind of loop about right. So what they do is they anthropomorphize the robot, but they also technomorphize themselves. So they'll do things like this. There, there's there's a scientist. She's sitting and they're figuring out how to move the rover and she'll pick up her phone and she's sitting on a, a chair with wheels and she'll put it in front of her and go. We need to do this. We, we, we need to do this, right? And she, what she's doing is she's becoming the rover and she's enacting it. And she, right? And so, so they, they technomorphize themselves and they anthropomorphize the rover. And then they get into really, really interesting places. They'll say things like this. And this is so exciting. Like for a rocket scientist, hard note scientist, they'll say things like, you know, I was in the garden and I was gardening and my right wrist was really sore. And then I got to the lab and Spirit, that's the name, uh, ironically enough, uh, Spirit, the, that's when the name of one of the rovers, its right wheel was stuck. And I don't oh. know, right? And they, like, and they do, I don't know. I mean, there's some sort of sympathetic connection. 
and they're struggling, <laughs> right? They're struggling because they have this, they have this flatland epistemology, ontology, and the, the yeah. two options to them is it's all just crazy or it's magic. They don't have an epistemology and an ontology that's rich enough to allow them to talk about that because they can't deny it. In fact, they rely on this. They rely on like seeing like the rover and being the rover. Oh, like, that's great. <laughs> well, so I feel as if, uh, here's what I, here's what, here's my new term, metaphysics of childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I made that up. And, and I, I I'm uh, suggesting that uh, there's kind of a natural you know, and when I mean, uh, you know, obviously the baby isn't doing metaphysics, but um, there's a, a natural inclination to be joyous in the real. <laughs> yes. And, and um, I feel as if that, uh, you know, def that's our deepest default as far as knowing goes. And then, you know, along comes grade school and it's, we're kind of talked out of it. And, and then we're told that that's illegitimate, yet we, because it's, um, and you might've said something in, the, in that meaning thing that, that goes with it. It's, 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 it's philosophically presumed in anything that we do. Yes. So that no matter how, uh, rigid we try to be in our linearity we're still relying on it we, we rely on it to deny it and so i find that in my epistemological therapy i just need to get people back to what they're truthfully doing in connection in connection with the real does that make that, sense it does i mean uh, i'm sorry i almost interrupted you because i like i was yes because that that's the, the, the deep, like in order to do the theorizing, the scientists have to develop the skills, but in order to develop the skills, they have to get this perspectival knowing with that sense of presence. And in order to get that sense of presence, they have to do this mutual indwelling identification thing. It's a, it's a relationship of dependence that's clearly indicated in that. That's why we, I think that's what uh, the point, that's the fundamental point we're making. And that's why we were able to get these papers published. And, and I think that's right. Polanyi, Polanyi was a discoverer. That was his job. To me, that's like being a professional baseball player where you're so good, they actually give you an error if you miss. That's that's how it seems to me. Right, you know, right, that right. was his job to discover things, <laughs> right? That means going from zero to 60 with regard to not knowing to, to knowing, you know, and there's no linear way, you know, there's no linear way that that, there's no linear way that would account for that. I agree. So yeah. could you, you've mentioned this a couple of times and, and um, I, I, I wanna sort of uh, step, step back. You've invoked epistemological therapy and how you might now supplement it with ontological or metaphysical therapy, but what do you exactly mean? Like, what is the, I, I take it there's a practice that you're pointing to. What does that practice look like? And, and why do people come to you for it? And uh, yeah, yeah. That's, thank you for asking that. So I believe that Polanyi said, I, I think this is the main claim that he was made, making, according to Marjorie Green, no knowledge is wholly focal yeah, and explicit information transferable, you know? And so that means a whole pile of our knowledge isn't, <laughs> and it isn't articulable. And I would like to suggest that any, epistemological default is probably not focal <laughs> and it probably is bodied yes and uh it's not you know if i'm going to combat the uh defective epistemology that claims that knowledge is information how am i going to do that by giving more information mm, mm, mm. so i uh, have tried i i've got to be subversive in a way that makes your body feel feel it. And, and I, I, I guess I say this in longing to know, it's as if my body had become Cartesian, which means my body was an object, yes. which I think is part of the problem that we have in maybe more Protestant uh, 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 traditions. You know, we've got this, this mind-body divorce. So, 
you know, obviously the mind is the religious part. If anything is, it can't be your body. And so then your body's this meaningless yeah. object, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so I really think we, we body our philosophical orientation. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take something more like a, a change of your body. And that's going to mean using words, not as information, but more maximic, as, as Polanyi said, to get bodies to shift, to feel, to feel it. Yes. So yes. that's why I call it therapy. It's just saying, look, I'm denying that knowledge is merely information. So I can't give you more information or I would be being inconsistent with what I'm saying. And so I've got to do something that's more like therapy to to redraw the playing field that you actually body forth. How am I doing? <laughs> That's great. That was, no, I, don't take my, don't misread my silence. I was savoring that. I mean, uh, I, you, I, you're no doubt aware about, you know, the emphasis in 4E cognitive science on embodiment, embeddedness, and active extent, you know, extended. Um, and, 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 and I just would add the word subsidiary. I mean, I just think so the word subsidiary helps us get what embodiment ought to be, and what we ought to do with it. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if I'm disagreeing with you about that. I, I'm just, I was just saying that the emphasis yeah. on the fact that we're knowing through our body and we just don't, it's not like, Evan Thompson, in fact, wrote the famous article on the body-body problem. There's a, the body we have <laughs> as an object that we know, and then there's the body that we know through. And part of what we're what we struggle with, right, philosophically, is what's the relationship between the body we know about as an object and the body we know through, as you're this saying. This is why it's so weird to go get a physical with the doctor. Because yeah. for, for him, you're plumbing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, the, I've had good doctors that um, took the time uh, yeah. to try and, but I've had doctors that did treat me like uh, plugged up plumbing that had to be alleviated in some fashion. So, no. <laughs> And I think what people often talked about with bedside manners was more than just polite consideration. It was ability yeah. to have that kind of gnosis, that yeah, yeah, like, yeah. trying to know the person uh, rather than just the object. So, but what I'm trying to get at I, 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 is, um, I assume that you're talking to somebody when you're doing this um, epistemological therapy. And yeah. you're, you're being subversive, like, like Socrates or Wittgenstein in the, in the sense that you're not trying to, or maybe Kierkegaard, you're not trying to go like, yeah, you know, I'm not just going to give you more propositions. I'm going to throw out proposition, or maybe Jesus of Nazareth would, would resonate with you even more. I'm going to give you something that looks like a narrative about this son who leaves his dad and comes back. It looks like an everyday story. And then when you try to think about it, it just blows up your mind. It just explodes. Um, so right? you want to know what I'm actually saying to people? Well, I'm, if, you, if it's not intrusive. I start with, let's talk about riding a bike. Mm -hmm. So I, I spend a long time talking about bike riding. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I tell the story of my, the way my father taught me to ride, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and, you know, the plan, <laughs> and what, what it takes for you to ride a bike is you've got to subsidiarily and dwell it, dwell it. And that sense of keeping your balance on a bike, which is absolutely essential to bike riding is not articulable, mm -hmm. and, but it's palpable. It's not mystical. It's not subjective. It's trainable, but it's from knowledge. Just like, you know, driving any skill. I mean, Pilates said it's all, you know, it's all skilled knowledge. It's like you, you have this artful subsidiary bodied indwelling. That's, that's what keeping your balance is. And so then, and, and you know, what I think modernist epistemology is would be me stopping to look down at my foot on the, on the pedal, which would be disastrous, right? So, yes. so, I, I get people uh, talking about their skills. I get them to name their most common skill. 
Mm -hmm. and, and then start to apply the subsidiary focal integration. You, in longing to know, I've got three sectors of clues, the, the directions, the, the situation, and, and the body. You know, the, I get them to name all those things. Here's another fun thing I do, I think. I think this is telling. Um, I tell everybody, pick up a pencil, a piece of paper, and write a sentence. So like a five-word sentence. I make, them, I make them write it. And then I say, now take your pencil and put it in the other hand and write the same yeah. sentence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all really upset, you know? And then, and then I say, now just reward yourself and put it back in the correct hand, write the sentence again and say, oh, praise God for subsidiary focal integration, <laughs> because you have artfully learned to indwell and implement and paper so that you can do philosophy while you're, you know, doing all this stuff with your hands, you know? So, so uh, first of all, I'll, I'll relate. Uh, I, I, I've been using the bike riding thing in my lectures for many years, but what I do is I do it from the perspective of a dad trying to teach his son how to ride a bike. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, right, he's riding a bike. And here's, here's my entire genetic legacy and I'm putting it on like, and, 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 I, and what it, how it occurred to me was I'm saying these things to him. I'm saying like, keep your balance, look up, not too much like and i realized this is totally useless right, right, it's, right. <laughs> which is what i thought when my father was yelling balance you know i'm a baby skeptic it's like what does that even mean <laughs> you know? so, so what happens when like when they're confronted with that kind of aporia when they're confronted with the gap between you know verbalizable propositional and this and this that they can't like, well, like, so you, you, you're basically kind of shocking them. I, I mean, you're doing it, 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 it with respect. I get that, but you're, you're trying to like notice. You're trying to get them to notice. That, like, what do they do, and what are you hoping they do when they confront that gap? Well, uh, that's where it, when I start talking about my experience with Sarah Stravinska in ballet class when I was 33. Mm. and say what a teacher has to do, especially if they're teaching a body, is uh, not only utter the information, but then utter sentences that make a body feel what they're supposed to do. Right. And so, you know, in ballet work, you've got this, you know, you be begin with bar work, you know, and, and your arm's yeah. supposed to be out yeah. like this on the other side. And, and what happens is everybody's so busy thinking about their feet that their, their arm kind of goes up like this and the yeah, teacher yeah. goes yeah. along and fixes all their arms. Well, one day she said, pretend, pretend a drop of water falls on your shoulder and rolls yeah. down your arm. It does not come off at the elbow. It comes off at the third finger. And all of us went, whoop. <laughs> Yes, so yes. that was an axiomic sentence that made the body feel. And so I think to be a great writer, you know, you've, you've both got to give the argument, but you've got to somehow use your language in a way to make a body feel, feel what it is to, to feel. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? It does. I, I, I teach Tai Chi. Um, yeah, there you so, go. <laughs> you're, this is what I call this the, like the imaginal augmentation of perception. It's imagination for, the, this is the slogan I use with my students because they come in also with this, you know, almost Calvinistic notion of what the imagination is. And I'm saying, no, no, you're not forming mental picture in your head. What I want you to do is I want you to stand and I want you to feel as if you're, the bottom parts of your leg are sinking into mud. And then from yeah. your knees to your stomach, this is like flowing yeah. water. And then, from, right? And then from yeah. above is like, right? And then what they do is they go, oh, and then I'll say, okay, now put your arm out here. Now hold your arm how you would hold it if right right let it be bent but how it would feel if there was water flowing through your arm and going out yeah it's not just yeah. passively there but you're not moving so what do you like and they go oh oh nick winkleman talks about this in the language of coaching and i've talked to him about this use of enacted analogy right it, right and so that people get to this place where they can translate between your propositional utterance and then enacting right? A certain, like a certain way of being present to go, to yeah. go back to our, right? Yeah. And, and, the, and, and what's key for me is notice, like that, 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 well, that's what I call perspectival knowing. That state of presence is, is you've got to get them into that before yeah. you can give them the skills. If I, if, if, yeah. if, if, I, if I just show the, if I just show this, if I just show the punch, and they, right. and they haven't come to inhabit their mind and body the right way, they can mechanically reproduce it. But what they don't have is they don't have the virtuosity of the use 
of the skill. They have the skill, but they don't have the virtuosity of it. Yeah. So yeah, so that that, that I, I totally get what you're talking yeah, about. High five. <laughs> <laughs> so virtual so, high five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, virtual high five. <laughs> so th this leads this leads me to something because I mean this is also uh, you know an explicit you're not you're not being duplicitous this is an explicit uh, 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 goal of the book right like this 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 way of using right the imaginal not the imaginary but the imaginal to augment people's ability to inhabit re inhabit and and to get a sense of presence that tells them how to create and curate their skills, right? I take it that you're making an argument that there's something like that with respect to coming into a relationship with God or ultimate reality or, or, or that, that, right? That it's that kind of thing that, you, you, right? Um, and, and, you know, and, and the classical, as you said, the classical, you know, Christian metaphysics was, you know, you, you get the repeated, you can't do this unless you're going through the transform, transformative practices. Don't just read this. You have to do all this stuff and you have all this, all this stuff happening, right? And like, uh, even in Plato, like the Parmenides is such a hard dialogue, but you realize that what he's trying to get you to do is don't think of the forms as things. You can't think of the form as forms like you do, like you do physical objects. As long as you're doing that, you're fundamentally getting it wrong. And even saying to yourself, they're not things is not doing what I'm saying to you. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Uh, uh, so that was, sorry, that was kind of sort of a little bit uh, scattered. But what I'm trying to get at is I see, it, it, it seems to me there's a connection between the practice you're doing here in existential therapy and also the way you're trying to lead people into relationship with God in longing to know. Is, is that is that fair to see that connection? Well, the plan of the book is let's look at how knowing works. I mean, our problem is a, a lot of our problem with knowing God turns out to be a problem with knowing. That's that's, that's what exactly I would that yes, was me, right. the baby Cartesian, right? Yeah. And so let's redo knowing and then revisit the question of knowing God. So that that's just what the agenda of, of the book is. And you know, there's lots of ways that. Uh, I think you could articulate the kind of embodiment, you know, that you and I have been talking about right now, but one is just plain old obedience. So, so, uh, you know, obedience has to do with kind of making your body do things, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, yeah. and, and there, and there's a sense in which that's, you know, at one point I say in the book, it's lived truth, you know, it's like part of the genius of Polanyi's epistemology is you've got to get yourself in the right position <laughs> for yes. for the vista to open up of course. right of course. so so that's what the kind of the the uh maybe bodied reorientation would be all about and obedience is 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 you know one way to to see it so does that make sense well, it does, uh, but I, I was probably more in the book than that. I and actually, I just read it because I read it to record it for um, Audible. Oh, oh so, that's um, but you know, that was well, last I, week. I don't have a very long memory. <laughs> luck, lucky listeners, because your enthusiasm will come through in your reading, and that's that. that, that, that <laughs> well, the funny thing was, I kept breaking down and crying. Oh. <laughs> You know, it's just there's these stories in there that just undo me, you know, so they'd have to pause, <laughs> you know, while I cried and then start again. But anyway. No, no, I just, that, I just want to pick up on, on that, but I, I, I'm trying to get a, a, maybe a more specific connection. I see what you're doing in existential therapy, right? Right. Uh, you're, you're, you're doing, you're saying you're getting. Psychological the, therapy. Is that what you mean? It, what did I say? Okay. All right, you said existential therapy. Oh, I meant epistemological therapy. I'm okay. sorry. Right. Because I, I was leaping ahead of my thinking. Because what I see you doing is getting people to make not just a propositional turn, but an existential turn, right? They're, they're reorienting in a fundamental way. And I take yeah. it that that, that that is a species or right, of a larger genus that includes that, that what, you know, what the Christian tradition calls metanoia which is not just changing beliefs, but it is this metanoia. It's a new, it's a beyond way of noticing that you didn't have before, right? And because I'm, because there's, you, 
you didn't quite finish the autobiography because you told me how you fell out of belief, all right? But I didn't oh, quite- no, I never fell out of belief. <laughs> well, oh, 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 so I don't know. I, I, yeah, no, I, I mean, I love Jesus, I, you know? I, and oh, the, I see. The better I get, the better it gets, you know? I mean, to me, what I'm doing right now is just of a piece with my exuberant love with love for, for God. But, but I think what I, I did was get out of modernist epistemology. So was the church, because you, you like, did, 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 I, I got a sense that there was something that you found dissatisfactory, though. You talked about that at the beginning. You were brought up in this, and you were finding that it what wasn't, like, what was the lack that initially drove you into this exploration? I, well, first of all, because I, I um, have dealt with a lot of self-doubt, uh, self the You're lack was me. I was sure it was me, that the problem was me. And, and then, so it was kind of enlightening to realize that the problem was philosophical. Right. And then, you know, it's really been over the years that it dawned on me that the problem with the church had a lot to do with defective uh, modernist epistemology. Right, right, I so, see. So, and, and, you know, I t in longing to know, I tell the story of Michael. Well, that Michael's story and that class in which I had him was, uh, and I say this in longing to know, I do remember this from last week, but, but that, that I presumed that, you know, here I'm coming back. It's the first time ever that I ever get to teach this. I'm like 48. I've been raising my babies, you know, my mind has gone to mush and I would come back and I think, well, you know, what am I going to have to say to young people? Because, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have the problems I do because the milieu has moved on. That's what I thought. Wow. So I was shocked when, you know, Michael and others in this class of cream of the crop students were just like, oh, this is what I need. Yeah, and then yeah. I realized that if somebody's going to ask you to consider G Jesus or Christianity and you're and you, you know, it's like it, you have to decide on questions about truth and reality. You can't just say, oh, you know, truth and reality don't matter if somebody's presenting Jesus to you. So I realized that even though maybe I felt like I was outdated, <laughs> you know, I wasn't because people considering Christianity have got to deal with those things. So that's, that's I well. found myself in God's kindness through my Polanian training, somehow still in vogue. I, I had very I'm, similar. I just think it's so what, what he did just needs to be spread. And you asked me what my mission in life is. I really feel like uh, this is the message that God has given to me to, to share, I, and I think it ha can have influence and impact life by life, and my job is to steward that. So I try to find as many ways as I can to get the message out to other people. Well, there, that, that answered my question very well. That's what I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand what the shift is and what the shift was for you. Um, and. Uh, I had something analogous in the, when I uh, when I started talking about meaning and the meaning crisis to students, and their eyes opened up, and they really wanted to talk, and they really wanted to learn how to practice, and they would they went from learning for the, the test uh, to learning for their life, um, and you, you can see that trans that yeah. uh, that that transition, and so I, I think I have a sense of what you're talking about. Um, um, I I really how how could where should people start if they want to get more familiar with your work should they start with longing to know should they start with i realize like i realized i i bought them in quarter or order of publication but as i was reading this i was going oh this actually comes before this right <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah what, what would I you came, recommend well uh for years now at geneva college uh where i got hired because um of longing to know. Right. Um, I taught this course in which uh, I got to teach my stuff and the two texts were longing to know and then loving to know. And we would romp through longing to know, not so much for the religious part of it, but for in my work, it's the, the most drawn out uh, getting on board with Polanyi's 
subsidiary yep. vertical integration, which, yeah. you know, the thing is, as you know, if you're fixing people's epistemology, you also have to fix how they read of because they're, they've been in this reading information yeah. sort of a thing. And so then, you know, you to, to get to class, and this is the other thing I would say is if people can read longing to know, then loving to know, but somehow hear me, like invite me to speak or look at YouTubes or something like that, they might get a sense of kind of what it feels like. Right? Right. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, and so, that does. So it, I find that even places that teach my work, when I show up, stuff happens. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, but I'd say longing to know and then and then loving to know. Uh, and and what I find is in in both of those books, the, the transformation is kind of gradual. It it there just comes this place where there's the switch. Right. And then at the end of that course, I made everybody do a covenant epistemology project, which was um, they had to um, identify and undertake an act of coming to know and then show how it displays all the features of knowing that covenant epistemology commends. So so I like starting with longing to know just for that presentation of subsidiary focal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, you've, got, and you've got questions. If you want to start talking about love, like I said, it's, you know, I talk about the daisy, you know, the stuff like rationality and science is privileged in, in the middle of the daisy, but then the marginalized things are on the pedal. So faith is on the pedal, emotions on the pedal, you know, arts on the pedal, those kinds of things. And so people, and little manual tries to start with love, but, you know, I kind of pity the engineers. <laughs> You know, it's like, I was like, go read chapter four first. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So, so I think getting on board with subsidiary focal integration and seeing, look, this is good for seeing how baseball works, <laughs> you know, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, but then going in to talk about this kind of more interpersonal encounter-esque. I've got a boober chapter I saw on your shelf in the video you had Ithal. There, yeah, there. I've done a I did a video series with uh, uh, Zevi Slava and, and Guy Senstock on on Buber, uh, comparing okay. comparing the mystical aspects of Buber and the dialogical aspects of Buber, and how do they how do they talk to each other, and what about Buber's own uh, conversion and what was going on there? Very much, yes. Do you know the name James Loader? I don't think so. I've got two Loader chapters. Well, he he was a psychologist uh educator theologian at princeton very very in uh, uh, interdisciplinary and dense so the book i engage with is his um it's called the transforming moment and it's oh. a it's an it's an account of convictional knowing which would be the you know the holy spirit showing up and convicting you know being present and convicting you right so so i i have two loader chapters in loving to know well, I'm gonna to have to get loving to know. That's clear. Um, uh, yeah. Well, maybe uh, maybe you could come back and we could and and have a part two in which we could expand on uh, a covenant epistemology. I'm just getting a sense of it. Um, I don't have loving to know yet, but I can get it and uh, and reflect on it. Um, but uh, I, I we're I'd like to give people as we come towards the end you know, that are, are that are guests, uh, you know, any the final word, so to speak, what would you, what would you like to say, uh, sort of uh, at the end of our conversation today? Well, I would, I guess I'd recur to the fact that, that what we're here for is communion with the real and what we're called to be as lovers of the real. I mean, that's just to die for. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I, I totally, I totally. That's, why, that's uh, what we're supposed to be about. <laughs> You know, so yeah, yeah. so go and do that. <laughs> so um, if you want, Esther, if there's any links you want me to put into the description, uh, let me know. But uh, I, and uh, oh, look, my website, if you would share my website, I'm happy to share your website. Happy, happy to do that. And if you uh, in there. good and uh, and we've, we've already got the 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 video recommendation of the two books, Longing to Know and Loving to Know. Um, so, but like I say, send me any further links you want and I'll make sure that they get in there. And like I said, I've extended the invitation. I mean, it, it'd be great Thank if you, you could come back and we could talk again. Um, well, I, I'm I, invited again. Thank you. And I'm so glad to make your acquaintance. <laughs> me too.
Take good care. Thank you, John.